Welcome to Study with the Best, the magazine show that's all about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pina. On today's show, we take a look at CUNY people who are transforming lives. We revisit stories from the past year, which include a program that teaches seniors modern technology, a rooftop garden that gives kids a new perspective on city life, and a swim program for veterans. But first, City kids may not have as much access to nature as kids elsewhere, and one program is giving these kids a hands-on experience in building a rooftop garden, helping them to see that there's more to urban life in the city. In New York City, eight million people live within five square miles. It is the definition of the urban jungle. One of the interesting things about New York City is it's such a built environment and the human impact on New York City is so overwhelming and so visible. It's so important that we here in New York think about our impact on the world and our ecological footprint. And that's an issue that matters to all of us, but it particularly matters to youth because they're here now, but they're gonna be here long after we're gone. I think that kids are really looking for a way to make a difference and to have a meaningful impact on their worlds. To that end, Rebecca and the CUNY Center for Urban Environmental Reform is helping young people connect with Global Kids, where they are working to create more green space in the city. Global Kids has a program called the Human Rights Activist Project that goes on in several New York City high schools after school. In the Human Rights Activist Project, young people identify issues that are going on in their community that they find important and they would like to make change around. In this particular case, Green Roofs was the topic that our young people around the city wanted to focus on as an issue. We, we've been checking out different sites that have rooftop gardens. A green roof or a green farm is positive to the community around it or, or the society around it in many ways. It first of all acts as a carbon sink, it helps block the sounds around it, it acts as a beautification site, and also it provides a fresh source of food for not only the people living in the building, but also for the community around it. Green farm can just do so much for the environment that, that'll make my life extend even longer. A lot of people don't even realize what a green roof is, so coming here and seeing the, the farm itself is a revelatory experience. It's just this really beautiful, awe-inspiring place. And, Global kids, when they came here, they were really moved by it. And I think very similar to a lot of the other uh, youth that come here, this is something that they want. Um, they want to see more of this uh, in their own communities. Green Roofs on Schools is really a, a compelling campaign. It would not only be really good for the kids, but just really good for the city in general. Our young people have created a, an online petition, they have paper petitions that they're getting signed currently and, and they have been getting signed throughout the year. Um, we're going to deliver that petition uh, to the school chancellor and the mayor to hopefully get this implemented in, in schools. I will be actively advocating for having a green roof on my school and I will be doing my share when time comes to create, build, help and run the program. While Global Kids has been helping young people advocate for green roofs, CUNY law professor Rebecca Bratsby's is reaching young people in yet another way, through the medium of comic books. My Zlot, I think, is the thing I am most proud of in my work to date. It is a way to help people understand, first of all, what environmental justice is and what environmental issues are, and also to understand the power that they have and the way that they can actually do something to change their world and to participate in decision making around environmental issues. It was really important to us to have the main character be a, a young girl and to be a person of color because environmental justice is about the fair treatment and meaningful participation of all people. Youth have a passion for fairness, they have a passion for justice, and they're looking for ways to express that. I want to be an environmental lawyer. And after I came here, I realized that um, I, I should actually help the environment with something that I enjoy doing. Not only will this whole like, environmental issue affect me as like in this time period, but also afterwards, because if I actually want to take action, I would have to like be the best in what I do to actually uh, let's say not only talk to a principal of school, but actually talk to the president or vice president of a country. Jane K. 
Katz has dedicated her life to swimming, both as a competitor and as a teacher. And now she's helping veterans with a new rehabilitation program that takes place entirely in the pool. <laughs> the latest splash is the Wets for Vets program, water exercise techniques and training for vets not only physically, but holistically, spiritually, emotionally, to have fun while integrating back into their civilian life. Every member of the student body is more than welcome to come. Water's the great equalizer. My father was a veteran, and many people in my life I've known have been veterans. My late husband was a veteran. The students that would come in as veterans even though they were at school, they seem removed from the mainstream of civilian life and students. We've had several uh, veterans at the school here that have come back and had to deal with things like family problems at home that they could not take care of when they were overseas, uh, financial obligations and so forth. So it's just been huge in my personal life getting that exercise, which is not easy to come by with a grueling schedule that we have to maintain here as college students. You've been away so long from your family. They sometimes say you, you have changed because you have so come adapt to a war zone that you're always like sometimes on the edge. So what I do enjoy here is that we get to release our stress. Playing water volleyball, stretching, buddying up because it's the buddy system both on the field and in the water. Working together gets you to get away from your immediate concerns in life. Perhaps they were very, very fit when they were in the service, and when they come out, they don't want to work out necessarily the way we normally think of going to a gym or a pool, because they don't have to now. I do have injuries with my joints, and um, when I'm in the water because of that, I push my body more, so I get more out of my workout than if I were supposed to go to the gym. Also, when you're working out in the gym, you don't have the, I guess, the surrounding of talking to people. Many of the people that join our Wets for Vets program are not swimmers yet. They can run, they can cycle, they are trained to do that, but the swimming is the X factor. So it's really important for people to kind of aspire to something. Some of the muscles and joints aren't the way they should be as opposed to some of the other students that are non-veterans here. So the water has just been tremendous in giving us that advantage uh, from a physical standpoint. And then psychologically, it's uh, also just smoothing and just relaxing in a different environment as opposed to loud music in a gym. When I'm in the water, no matter what my day is like, I finally wake up and then you can go on with the rest of your day. And that mantra has been with me my entire life. And it was just a year ago, almost when my late husband passed away, that we started the program. So it, it's a very personal time. I'm sure that many of the vets who have lost their buddies or have had injuries or their buddies have had injuries, they remember that. And that's why it's so important to, to keep their, their spirit alive and blooming. When we come in, if something is wrong, I could always talk to Professor Katz, like maybe grieve, because I've dealt with this this semester. I'm still dealing with it, but when I get in the pool and when I get out, I'm totally different. I feel happier. I feel like my mind is more calm, more relaxed. I can focus. It makes us feel great by the end of the day and be able to tackle our homework and integrating us basically back to civilian life. Just be able to let everything go. lives doesn't happen just locally. In fact, for years, students in the Bronx have been going abroad as volunteers as part of the Lehman Life program. Barry Mitchell takes a look. When we last visited the globe-trotting community service organization Lehman College Life, leaders involved for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. One group had just returned from Johannesburg, South Africa, where they volunteered in a residential community for mothers and children with HIV. In the past year since we last spoke, we've been to Chicago, Puerto Rico, Kenya, and Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, and that's just in the past year. And their most recent adventure? I'm just very happy to be here, um, to actually get to Honduras. Of us 
Honduras over in the library. Honduras is one of the poorest countries in Central America. It's close to the equator, so it's really hot. My name is Sharonda Aponide, and I just graduated here from Lehman with a degree in speech pathology. 19 members of Lehman Life departed from Newark Airport to spend eight days in the Honduran city of El Progreso. It's part of an ongoing project called Students Helping Honduras, which recruits college students from all over America. We lived and worked in Villa Soleada, a former shanty town. There, we worked with local families to help build a library, a school, and an orphanage. I feel happy to be out here and not be surrounded by um, traffic and having to worry about daily life. And I get to experience something that I wouldn't do if I was to just buy a plane ticket and go and visit a country. Lehman Life is a program where we take students from Lehman across the globe and across the U.S. to be able to partner with grassroots leaders and give back to a community based on what they need. So that can range from construction to working in elderly nursing homes to volunteering with homeless organizations or building schools in the slums of Kenya. But Amanda says charity begins at home. And in order to even qualify to do the program, they have to volunteer for 25 hours at home in the Bronx because we feel that you can't go and volunteer somewhere else if you have no idea what the needs are in your own community. My name is Juan Cruz, and I'm a graduate student here at Lehman College. In Honduras, I did the role of a reflector. Every day we had a debriefing where we shared our experiences and we had activities. Which was often an evening soccer match. And because Juan's major is middle and secondary education, Aside from being a reflector, I also tutor some of the local students there who were interested in learning English. It was with bilingual students, which is a demographic population that I wish to work with in New York. Students must pay their own way, airfare, travel insurance, everything. And they fundraise that money just to be able to go and do work and volunteer. It's, it's amazing. And a new fundraising idea, a global citizenship gala, a big bash at a fancy Bronx catering hall that attracted local dignitaries and business leaders. <laughs> we raised $17,000 in one night. My name is Cyril Njiken. I'm originally from Cameroon in Central Africa, and I'm a senior at Lehman College. I'm not your typical student. I'm 38, I'm married, and I have four boys. And Cyril shot the Honduras video you've been watching. I went to Honduras um, expecting to help the community, but I didn't expect that side of seeing those children without parents. And that, that was an emotional scene for me because I knew that these children were orphans. Just thinking about it bring me tears to my eyes. The most memorable thing about Honduras was how familiar it was to me. It reminded me of my home country in Ghana, dealing with no water at times, no electricity, and just the camaraderie of the people of the village together. It just had the same feeling. The way they are and the way they're together, we don't have that. And just, that's something I'm learning. And that's something I'd love to bring back, you know, to my community, not just back to my house, but to the community where I live, like, that togetherness, you know, and, um, just that. Before they leave, they don't realize how much they have and how fortunate they are. And while they're there, you see that shift. I didn't come here fun for vacation. I came here to be part of something bigger than myself. If you'd like to learn more about Lehman Life or to donate, visit us on the Lehman homepage and select Community Engagement. Hope to see you at our next fundraiser. And bring money. <laughs> Barry Mitchell, study with the best. The city of New York is also transforming the lives of high school graduates with the restoration of the CUNY Merit-Based Scholarship Program. In fiscal year 15, the New York City Council is investing $11.1 million into the implementation of this invaluable program. Woo! This is going to provide merit-based scholarship to New York City high school graduates 
who will maintain at least a B average at CUNY and at FIT. In fiscal year 15, scholarships of approximately $400 per semester will be available to first-year students. And as the cost of higher education rises, unfortunately, uh, we must do everything we can to make sure that it remains within the reach of young people who are our city's future. So the CUNY Merit-Based Scholarship represents our commitment to today to our city's tomorrow. Today we are standing in front of you to announce that we have $11.1 .1 million that will benefit more than 13,000 students from every corner of the city. One United City Council just encouraged student leaders like me and all the leaders that you see behind me to encourage them to be, get more involved, get more involved with City Council and with the issues that face our communities today. And I would like to thank them for that initiative. Yeah. And we're looking forward to a great partnership to build this New York City Merit uh, City Council scholarship to better and, and take, so more students can take advantage from this scholarship. This allocation by the New York City Council is not an expenditure. The speaker used the words investment. And the reason she used the word investment, I would put forth, is because our students remain in New York. They work here, they live here, they have jobs here. They will repay back that $800 many, many times over. They are the future. They'll be paying the taxes. They represent the stable tax base that this city needs in order to move forward. Technology changes at a rapid pace and it can be daunting for older adults to keep up. But one New York City nonprofit is training seniors on technology and changing their lives. Technology scares me because I'm one of these people who doesn't want change and everything has changed. I have to be part of the modern technology and I don't want the world passing me by and I want to seem younger. Only 54% of Americans over the age of 65 have used the internet. America is in the midst of a longevity revolution. We've added more time to the human lifespan this century than we did in all of previous history before that. How do you recraft society and our social practices to live into your 90s? I would like to order things online in a safe way, protecting our identity. My nephew sent me an iPad for my birthday. I was 88 this year, and so technically, I thought it impossible, I cannot learn, I thought I couldn't. Technology presents a wonderful opportunity to help people equip themselves, get ready for that time, pick new projects, be creative, um, find a path in workforce or a path in uh, uh, volunteering or civic engagement. We have older adults who are looking for work, they need to be able to PDF a resume and go online and find a job, use LinkedIn, things like that. So uh, working with ATP, we developed a curriculum on that and people are learning that here. At my age, and I am over 60, um, I have to learn to, how to submit a modern resume, which I haven't done in 20, 30 years, and I have to send it via computer and using the internet. And at, at, with my technology, I went, huh? One in every five senior citizens is socially isolated. And technology is really a powerful way for rebuilding their social networks. So we're working with the AARP Foundation on a special project to use volunteers and help seniors use iPads to become more socially engaged. Um, healthcare access and healthcare information, very powerful area where seniors need to have technology to manage all those new um, digital health resources that are coming along. But well, he's on oxygen, so we've looked up some new things and we missed a trip last year to Mexico where we've been going for 21 years. I looked up just recently, in fact, just two days ago, and found out there were new uh, situations for um, oxygen concentrators. And actually, we've started the ball rolling so that we can get to Mexico in January. We have a woman who came in, she mentioned that she sells handbags, and then somebody said, well, do you know about Etsy? And Etsy is an online you know, site where people sell things. She opened an Etsy account, and then she sold her first bag right there at that computer through her Etsy account. She jumped up one day and said, ooh, something, I just sold a bag. We get homework assignments, 
that we're asked to go on Google, gather information from the Times. I've really gained confidence. My husband passed away, but years ago, we, he, he was a boxing fiend. He loved boxing. So we went out and we got, a, a, we got a, two sets of, of regulation lightweight gloves, and we would actually box in, in, in the house. And it was fun. We didn't really get hurt. A couple of times we got a little damaged, but not really hurt. But here I'm, I'm fighting a, um, an imaginary character, but you really, you, you really get at him. You want to get him. It's really fun. While I was in graduate school, um, one of the women in my program at, uh, in the political science department was in her 60s and she was retired and was going back for a PhD and it was sort of a little bit of an inspiration to me that people that are older than 60 can keep learning and developing new uh, kind of paths in their lives and, and that was a little bit of the backdrop for when I started Oats years later um, you know CUNY actually had a, uh, a role in that for me and, and has been meaningful to me. Laughing at me. Let's take a look at a language program at Queens College, which has been helping new arrivals to write and speak English since 1945. I felt like I needed to improve my English before I'm starting my college lessons. I was worried of how I could handle the situation in college, in school, my classes. I came to America um, in June this year. I came to America to improve my English to study in college next semester. The English Language Institute of Queens College is the oldest intensive English program in CUNY. We've grown to an average of about four to five hundred students a semester. The international students are the recent immigrants come to us and they've never been away from their families or they're landing in a new place. So in a way our teachers are like their home away from home. Their classmates are their friends away from home. Most of our teachers have been with us for many, many years. The secret to our success, I believe, are the teachers. And if you don't have a plan, you need to get a plan because very soon when you're studying in the university, you're going to have so many classes and so many responsibilities. The motivation level of uh, ESL students is very high. Many uh, really want to learn and it's, and it's a challenge to keep up with that, motiva their motivation level sometimes. I'm most proud when they're able to get into a college, whether it's in the CUNY system or farther afield, and succeed. It's the, the best compliment to have someone who can study at a foreign university in a foreign language. I think that's a huge accomplishment. Oh, We're talking about real issues, interject with humor when the students can laugh, when the students can kind of lose themselves in speaking the language. And then often their fluency improves. The English Language Institute actually has two programs. The daytime program is a full-time intensive program and we also have a part-time evening program. I think the goals for the students at the day program, over 50% of them, their intention is to go on to a university. People are studying in the evening group part-time in order to improve their employability at work. Some of them want to learn English so that they can help their children with their homework, speak with their children's teachers. The one thing we face are students that are reticent, perhaps culturally taught to listen more than participate we have to get them to speak. I came to America three months ago for studying English and maybe some further subject. I'm very uh, interested in business, so I would get to know more about you know, uh, different market, how, how different people act and how different people think. I came here to study and improve my English and um, later on for internships. The classes here is uh, focused more on writing than I used to do in, back in Korea. One of the most rewarding parts of my job is seeing students grow, uh, seeing families reunited, and just knowing that this institute has been here for a long time servicing uh, the local population as well as the international population. That's our show for today. For more information on what you just saw, log on to our website at cuny.tv or you can Facebook and tweet us. Thanks for watching. See you next time.